All right, in this lecture, all I want to do is to present to you guys and introduce some of the most common research designs that you'll encounter. First of all, in some of the research that we'll be discussing this semester and the examples that we'll be using, but also the most common types of designs that you guys might naturally want to deploy for some of the topics and things that you guys are going to want to do in your own research projects. Now, I know that we've already talked about the distinction between, between subjects, repeated measures, and paired sample designs. But we can also be much more specific in terms of exactly how these different designs are instantiated. We've also talked about the distinction between true experiments that are discussed in Chapter 9 in your textbook and quasi-experimental methods that are discussed in Chapter 13. And as you'll see, a lot of the most common types of designs have both a true experimental and a quasi-experimental counterpart. Now, in order to introduce these different types of designs, it's going to be very useful to use a common nomenclature or design notation. Now, typically the way this is done is to use some specific symbols that represent the different things that we do over the course of a research study. So, let's imagine that we just have, in general, two specific groups, an experimental and a control group. Well, as we know in a true experiment, the first thing that we want to do is to randomly assign our participant to one of these two different groups. And this is denoted by the R that's shown on the screen here. So as this we're moving from left to right across the screen here, and that's shown the, the progression of time by this arrow at the top, then we can think about what is it that's happening to each of our two different groups. Well the first thing that happens is they're randomly assigned to their condition, shown by the R. Well the next thing that happens over time is the experimental group receives some sort of manipulation. That's indicated by the x here. Okay, so the x is whatever our manipulation is, whatever the variable is that we we're instantiating, our treatment, if you will. And then what we might do is to then say, observe the behavior across the experimental and the control groups. That's indicated by the o that's shown here. So the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to observe or measure both the experimental and the control group. So you can see the sequence of events, again moving left to right, that's happened to each of these two different groups. The experimental group was randomly assigned to their group. They received a treatment, or a manipulation, indicated by an X. And then we observed or measured their behavior on some dependent variable, which is indicated by the O. Now, of course, the control group received the exact same uh, sequence of events, except for the manipulation or the treatment. And that's exactly, of course, what makes them the control group. So if you understand this type of design, then we can really map out any specific design that we want to instantiate by just thinking about, literally, where are our X's and O's. For example, what we can do is to add an additional pretest observation to the experimental and the control group. So now this is a situation where we've started out with, again, random assignment to one of two groups, an experimental or a control group. We've taken some sort of baseline measurement before our manipulation. Then we've instantiated our manipulation, but just for the experimental group as before. And then finally, we're observing or measuring behavior again at the conclusion of the experiment. Now, if you understand this basic notation, then what we can do is then to enumerate some of the different research designs. Again, these are covered all in your textbook across chapter 9 and 13 for the experimental and quasi-experimental counterparts, respectively. So let's think about some of these common research designs. The first is what they call a single group post-test only design. This is a quasi-experimental design that's covered in chapter 13. And if you think about what happens in this type of group, it's really very simple. You give some sort of manipulation, okay, or introduce some level of an independent variable, and then you measure the behavior after that variable. Now what this allows you to determine is, of course, given this variable or this effect, this treatment, what is the resulting behavior like after the fact. But as we've talked about, there are a number of limitations with this sort of design. There's no sort of comparison, no sort of reference that we have. Okay, we don't have a pretest of the same group of people. We don't have a control group that we're looking at in comparing this behavior to. So this is a very limited type of design. And again, this is one that we encountered quite some time ago. What we've seen is there are improvements to this design. Okay. What we can do is to think about, well, let's think about a similar type of design where we have a post-test measurement, but now let's include a control group. So now we would have specifically two different groups of participants. In an experimental design, what we would want to do is to randomly assign participants to one of those two different groups. We give one of our groups our manipulation, 
and then we measure both of the groups. This is what's referred to as a post-test only control group design. This is a between subjects design the way that it's introduced in chapter 9 in your textbook. Now this would be a true experimental design because what we have is random assignment and we have a comparison here. Those as we talked about are the two key things that we need for a true experiment. Now if we don't have random assignment then it would be what's referred to as a non-equivalent control group post-test only design. So now this would be a situation where we don't have random assignment to our two separate groups. We still have two groups, so we're still able to do this comparison. However, the difference here is without random assignment, there's nothing that it ensures that we have equivalent groups to start with. That's exactly why it's called a non-equivalent control group. Now these are both post-test only types of designs, or all three of them that we've seen on this screen here are. Okay? So this is a situation where we're measuring behavior after the manipulation takes place. However, there are also a lot of common designs that include pretests and post-tests. The simplest of these would be a single group pretest post-test design, where what you do is you pretest, you take a measurement or an observation before introducing any level of any variable. Then you introduce your manipulation, x, and then you measure again. Now this would be the simplest situation. You could conduct this as a within subjects design, for example where then what you might have is a measurement at the beginning, the manipulation, and the measurement afterwards. Then you can compare the pretest and the post-test scores or measurements, behaviors, and that can illuminate whether or not there's any effect of the manipulation X. Now there are other ways to introduce pretest, post-test designs as well. You can introduce pretests and post-tests for other reasons and when you're using multiple group designs. So for example, you can think about a pretest, post-test, control group design, a between subjects, true experimental design introduced in chapter 9, where again now what you have are two different groups. You have random assignment of individuals to one of those two groups. And then it proceeds just like you think a pretest, post-test design would. You establish the pretest or baseline measure. You introduce the manipulation to one group leaving the control group without the manipulation or treatment. And then you do your post-test measure. Again, then what you can do is, with this pretest established, then you not only are relying on random assignment to ensure that your two groups are equal at the beginning, but because you have this pretest measure, you're now able to look at a different score, that is a pretest to post-test, for each of these two different groups. And in this situation, even if there are some random factors that leave the control group and the experimental group not necessarily equivalent to begin with, if you happen to get all of the faster people in one group, or smarter people in one group, or more suspicious people, or more biased people, whatever the situation may be, okay, the things that we're leaving up to random assignment to, to equal out these individual differences across the groups, we're not only using random assignment in this case, but now we have a pretest, so we can measure were these groups in fact equal before we establish the manipulation in our experimental group. Okay, so this is a much more powerful design that allows us to draw stronger inferences and have better internal validity without having to worry about some of the confounds such as selection or non-equivalent groups. Now again, if we don't have random assignment, then it would be what's called a non-equivalent control group still a pretest post-test design, but now a situation similar to what we had on the previous slide where we have non-equivalent groups that aren't garnered by random assignment. But now again we still have the benefit of the pretest measure to identify are these groups similar before we've introduced our manipulation. And so this is definitely much stronger than the non-equivalent control group post-test only design that we talked about before. So now we've looked at a few different types of designs. Okay? Now it's not important to memorize exactly where are the X's and O's with each one and exactly what are the labels that are attached to each one because I understand that some of these are also a mouthful. But the important thing I think here to understand is the different ways that you can combine things as simple as including a pretest or not okay? and including a post-test and whether or not you're doing this within a single group of people or across two or more groups of people and there are really a number of different effects that you can identify and that you can measure and a number of confounds that you can control for 
and even if you can't control for them, you can explicitly measure them. So if you suspect the confound of having non-equivalent groups to start with, well, by introducing a pretest measure, as I mentioned, you can explicitly measure whether or not and identify whether or not these groups are indeed equivalent before introducing your experimental manipulation. And that's going to allow you, on the analytic side, if not the design side through random assignment, on the analytic side then, to try and eliminate any confounds and strengthen the internal validity of your design. Well, then you might ask yourself, well, why wouldn't we always just use a pretest post test design? And in fact, this is a very common design, and I think it's a great thing to use. And if anything, you should probably always be looking for ways to use a pretest post test design because of the strength that it gives you and uh, the, the benefits of the inferential logic. But what I'm going to do is pause here for a minute and end this part of the lecture. Moving on to part two of this lecture, we're going to look at what are some specific problems that might rear their head when you're looking at a pretest and post-test type of situation.